I don't know if she's gravid or like pregnant or if she's just flattening out her belly to get more sun, but either way, cool. All right, so I'm gonna set the record straight. Always been pretty neutral on this hobby, the reptile keeping, keeping pets. There seems to be a issue mainly for, and by the way, I'm just sorting out some of my isopod colonies in the dark. I think it looks cool, especially with this camera angle. There always seems to be an issue for reptile keepers worldwide in regards to, it's always the exotic pets, right? And like I said, I've always been neutral in this position. So basically, I'm going to give you my, I guess, two cents and opinion on this hobby. And that simply is, it's different for everyone who wants to keep exotic reptiles or exotic animals as pets. For me, it's been a hobby since I was a kid. Now, I know it's different for everyone in, in every part of the world. The opinion usually is, and you get a lot of it online, especially when you start posting things online. That's why I generally stay away from all those Facebook groups. I generally keep to myself, except for this channel, of course. And part of this is just because I enjoy making content and I enjoy keeping these animals. And I hope this inspires or gives people some more awareness about how dope these animals are. I live at the bottom of the world. And my experience has been that we only have a very limited group of animals we can keep as pets from a reptile perspective. Sorry, my little light shed itself. So what was I saying? Ah, yes. So basically, my experience has been, you know, I live at the bottom of the world. We only have a certain amount of animals you can keep in captivity here legally. So in New Zealand, it's Ill illegal to import reptiles and amphibians of any nature so we only have like five species of lizard three species of tortoise maybe five species of turtle and even then it's actually illegal to breed and sell them around the country so up north for example you can't uh, breed and sell blue tongue skinks but you can keep them in captivity so it's very very stringent and very strict here and because we can't import more it means that you only have the supply that we have so my rule has always been you know i still love these animals i want to keep them in captivity and i also I'm not promoting or encouraging more to come into the country. I'm just basically keeping what's already here. Um, and look, you might have your opinions and thoughts on breeding and all that jazz, but I also only take animals that need to be rehomed. So for example, Savannah, my blue tongue, uh, that video is coming soon. She's like three years old, four years old, and she was a rehome because the owner couldn't look after her. My Cunningham skinks as well, rehome because a person couldn't keep them anymore. They were older pair, not babies. Babies are easier to sell often they're small and cute so that's the first thing on the exotic pet side so and i get it in north america it's probably a little bit different in other parts of the world but i know even in north america you know there's rules around well not rules but there's ways you can be a good keeper or reptile keeper right so for example you source your animals from people that aren't getting them from the wild they're not being imported from the wild they're getting bred by in captive bred uh, situations and scenarios and, and you know reptile keeping one Keeping pets of any kind is always about, you know, there's always going to be good and bad people everywhere you look and everywhere you go. So as long as I do my best, you know, my best endeavors to make sure these guys have a good home and I look after them well or as best as I can and, you know, try and do what's best for them and provide them an environment that, you know, suits them and that they're happy. But even then, everyone's got limitations. We do our best. You know, some people could be space at home. Some people could be money. Yeah, look, you should always be prepared to keep these animals and have the budget to do so in capacity. I have capacity now later in life. You know, I have time on my side i feel a bit more stable with my life in regards to my situation i'm not traveling as much which i was doing when i was a lot younger the other side as well is i got a comment on youtube and i normally don't respond to negative or, or not constructive comments but i thought you know it made me ponder and i thought it's good to always explain your side of things and my side of things on this occasion was the comment was around native geckos of new zealand and you know you shouldn't keep them and you know they're in a cage and you act like you love them but you don't and i was just like yeah look i mean i get it people are sensitive about like i said pets animals regardless of their reptiles and amphibians it's, i see a lot more in the exotic pet trade but you still get it with cats and dogs and mice and rats and guinea pigs and rabbits but firstly just to more educate the world i suppose if they don't know the side of keeping native geckos of new zealand i can't speak for everyone in the world or every other uh country that I mean, some countries, it looks like they can literally keep anything and everything from every corner of the world. I'm pretty sure in Ireland, you can have pet meerkats. But anyway, that's a whole other story. So with native geckos, first things first, there's three things I want to talk to you about. First thing is you need a permit to keep them in captivity. Why do you need a permit? Because you're not allowed to take them from the wild. It's illegal in this country to take them from the wild because they're protected. Um, so you need a permit and the permit comes from the government or a government body that looks after the conservation efforts of New Zealand. So you need a permit. You need to prove that you can keep them in captivity. You need to prove that with husbandry experience. You need to prove that with you're going to feed them, how you're going to feed them, what you're going to keep them in, do you have the right environment, do you have the capacity, come and do an inspection, all this jazz. So you need a permit to keep them. Why do you need a permit to keep them conservation? Part two. So the point two I'm going to make is the conservation element. So I've always wanted to be involved in conservation on some level. And you know, and you can't always throw money at everything. It's cost of living crisis, guys. So one of the things you can do here is 
you can be part of conservation. So why you have a permit is because these guys, um, the New Zealand geckos are essentially classed as insurance population. So all the keepers that have permits to keep them around the country basically keep these species in captivity as insurance populations. So if anything dire happens in the wild because we have unwanted organisms, we have all these unwanted pests like ferrets, uh, ferrets stoats, weasels, even dogs and cats, mice, rats, they kill these geckos in the wild that were never here before humans colonized New Zealand. They also, destruction of habitat, New Zealand's a small country, so it doesn't take a lot for a whole colony of these geckos to be wiped out out of an area. A lot of them are offshore as well, which helps. So that's the other piece as well. So I'm doing my small part for conservation. I mean, they might never use my geckos that I have under my permit. They might just not need them and that's fine, but that's why we keep them in captivity because it's part of the conservation program here in New Zealand. That's the other thing. So it's a bit of education for my channel. And when I make videos about New Zealand geckos, it's specifically about the ones that I can keep with a permit in this country in the right circumstances and remember i'm not perfect i'm always learning i'm always consulting with the experts to do things better and i think that's one of the biggest disclaimers to do is that you know we're all none of us are perfect uh, reptile keepers we're all always learning we're always on this journey to be better and do things differently and explore and experiment and all that jazz so you know don't be too harsh on people that ask questions you know it's how you learn you can only learn by asking questions there's never a stupid question in this hobby it's just more around the fact that You'd rather them ask questions and do things right rather than potentially not doing appropriate husbandry and killing the animal or animal not being in great shape. Anyway, I digress. And the third thing is insurance populations. So I said that earlier. So for me, so when I said that, so what I said just before in the conservation piece, it kind of falls into the same thing. Geckos we keep or hold under the permit are insurance populations. So and they're different they categorize differently. So some are a lot more endangered, a lot more protected. They need to be they need to be micromanaged from a daily perspective. So you need to write, you know, how often they're shedding, how often they are how often they're feeding, what you're feeding them, how, when they breed, when they're born, when they die, and all that needs to be recorded and sent into the database of the government so they know what's happening with these insurance populations in our hands. So a vigorous process. It's not just it's not just old Richard going down the road into the bush and keeping us like I said, you can't do that. So that's my spell about native geckos here in New Zealand. It's, it's part of a bigger, it's bigger than me. So I'm just very fortunate I have a permit and I keep them in captivity and spread awareness. And that's, I suppose, the fourth thing is spreading awareness. That's all it is. So people around the world can see how amazing our flora and fauna is in this country, how amazing these geckos are. And yeah, yeah I throw a bit of an entertainment twist in it because I want people to enjoy the videos as well, rather than me just talking like this about gecko A and gecko B and gecko C. Um, you want the entertainment factor in so people can enjoy the videos. They can kind of, you know, inspire them to make videos of their own around their own animals that they have at home, whether it's leopard geckos or crested geckos, whatever it is. That's it. I mean, that's my spiel on why I do this and how it's a little bit different to other countries. So I, I suppose what I would say is don't be quick to judge others. You know, they're probably doing it for their own reasons. And look, it's okay to just enjoy also reptiles, amphibians, and captivity because it's a hobby and you like animals, like wildlife. I get it. You never, you're never gonna stop. You're never gonna stop certain people have opinions and everyone's got an opinion. That's great. But remember, it's just an opinion. So anyway, yeah, that's it. And right now I'm just going through my, like I said, isopod colony. And man, these guys are going well. I keep isopods all year round. They're really easy, man. Like easy bug. Easier than crickets for sure. Uh, well, this update, I've got some good cricket news coming. I finally bred my crickets. Probably the most vigorous exercise I've been through. Um, harder than probably most of my reptiles combined. Breeding crickets. Isopods, piece of piss, man. Throw them in some dirt, some leaves, some rotting wood. I give them like greens every third day. Give them some moisture. And they're good to go. You're going good. Otherwise, yeah, that's my spiel. Stay tuned. So this had the Royal Kawa geckos in it, then our outside full time. I'm going to transform this into a paradise for whistling tree frogs. It's going to have a mister. It's going to have a fogger. It's going to have epic paludarian backdrop. It's going to have essentially a like a little creek or stream in there. Probably have it about 10 centimeters deep so they can breed. There's going to be 15 tree frogs in here. Now, you know, I know what you're thinking. Is that big enough? Yes, these guys are small probably like that if not smaller so easy peasy this, this thing's huge man it's like 90 centimeters by 60 by 60 so plenty of height it's gonna have vines and well i don't know about vines but it's gonna have branches and it's gonna look essentially like it's sitting underneath a pond basically or like a little body of water it's gonna be epic epic so i have to take my cat to the vet today i'm sure you can hear him meowing in the background oso is her name we got Oso on lockdown, the very first lockdown. So the 2020, she was a gutter kitty. So when I say gutter kitty, I mean, obviously adopting a kitten that was abandoned. So apparently her and her brother were found in a shed, just a random shed behind someone's house. Two little kittens uh, given into a, um, I suppose, not a, not the SPCA, but an equivalent of like a, 
cat or kitten um, home, basically a you know a place where people can drop off abandoned cats and kittens, and they try to look for new homes. And they do, they're quite good, good program. They do the whole vac- get their first vaccination, get them a vet a little vet box. So her name was actually Smudge because she's like a tortoiseshell. But we uh, renamed her to Oso because we were really like Smudge. Um, but I get why he called her Smudge. The guy we actually got her from, um, this place reeked like weed. So he obviously smokes a lot of pipes, a lot of cats, a lot of cats to feed cats to hang out with. We'll take it to the vet. So I'm taking it to the vet because she hasn't been too good lately. So I think, and the vet thinks it's a UTI. Been pissing everywhere uh, and co- like frequently. So yesterday in a space of like 10 minutes, I saw her tinkle outside like three times. Um, we were having dinner and she was like literally tinkled twice in front of us while we we're having dinner outside. And then she tinkled on, she's been tinkling inside, um, even though she's an outdoor cat. And we saw yesterday, there was like crystals in her pee that she did inside. So I'm gonna give the vet the uh, drop that bombshell on them. It's either something to do with it. I'm guessing it's like kidney related. And we feed her a good diet, man. They're like our kitties are spoiled. Give the old pill signs with them in Blackhawk. But to be fair, it could be like sometimes the good food actually, should we say, like the veterinarian approved diets can impact them like maybe they have a reaction to it or they don't like it or their body doesn't like it which is fair enough it's not saying anything about the food it's a sensitive bladder potentially um, or she could have just got the infection she's had the infection they ran out of antibiotics yesterday so i'm dropping her off all day and she's doing a basically a day of testing um god I'm honestly i'm really stressing about the uh, monetary elements of it but that's okay we've got pet insurance um fuck me, fuck me to cover it so she's meowing she's uh has me too great and you know it's funny eh? so she's three so she's not that old and it's true what they say like she's not affectionate at all she's a grumpy little bitch at the best of times and lately she's been really really clingy and last night she slept on our bed which she doesn't do at all she sleeps in the lounge on her own on her own little couch away from everyone and she was like cuddling up with us and I was like, yeah, so she's definitely in pain. And I read about it, so when cats are extra affectionate, extra cuddly, it's because they're not feeling well or they're sick. And I'm like, ah, yes, well, that makes sense. She's got something going on and she has been extra cuddly and it's been very suspicious uh, behavior from her. So hopefully it goes well, drop her off for the day. And I'll give you guys an update if you care, but oh so. I mean, I have a soft spot for her. She's like my, she's our firstborn. She's my OG. She's like the first like personal cat I've had. Uh, me and my partner Paul, she's a little kitty pie in her own way, even though she's a bitch and grumpy. Just have a soft spot for them, you know? You know what I wanted to make take advantage of? This. It's a season. See this? This is natural endemic flowering. And look at it, look at all that. That's all the good stuff for the geckos. So we're gonna snap some of these off just as extra brows for the enclosure so it pops. Makes the enclosure looks great look makes the enclosure look great. Also gives them way more to climb on and also they're gonna get nectar from the flowerings. This is right. Great, this is grows my property. Fantastic. Even better. But great. Great access, I tell you. Yeah, yeah, here we go. That should be enough. Bit of each. Bit of brows. Bit of brows. So just by adding that flowering, look, it's popping. Give it a mist. Look at that. Looks nice. Perfect. I love that. Check up on the price geckos later. So I got also back from the vet in the afternoon and 215 bucks later. So she has a bladder infection. So they did a what's well, it's called covenial. Uh, antibiotics, a, a convenient antibiotic shot essentially, so it's a long lasting antibiotic injection, so it works over like a week or two, and then two weeks time we go back for more testing, so hope she's all good, little kitten, our firstborn animals, you know, that's what you do, you take them to the vet and make sure they're all healthy, and we knew some stuff was up, she wasn't feeling too well, but I'm glad I did that, got her checked out 215 bucks, so holy that's gonna hurt the old pocket, so we'll see, um, not cheap, but worth it honestly, Ferg's an absolute GA I fed him last night, whole block of bloodworms. He's good for the next two, three days. Uh, he's struggling right now. I don't know what it was. I don't know what's going on with him. He's typical. Turn the camera on, and he starts acting like an absolute weirdo. And then I turn the camera off, and he's acting like a mutant. Yep. Anyway, he'd actually clean out his tank. So my crickets finally hatched. And look at them, cute little guys. Look at them running around. See some are bigger, some are smaller, but I gotta replace their food, which is really hard to do because I can't really like like replace the whole tub, just in case I don't want to lose any. They're still coming out of there. Oh, I'm gonna go get some misting. It's all coming out of their laying tabs, but a bit of a switcheroo, see how these incubation tubs are going. First ever baby crickets, FYI, and going to clean out the adults, what remains of the adults. Hopefully some more eggs, we'll see. So the easiest way is actually to do this is get a replacement tub, put them in, just do the old switcheroo. This one's set up basically. This is where the adults are going to go. Get my paper towels in. So it's spring now, 
Days are getting warmer. Days are getting hotter. 20 degrees yesterday. Fucking hot. All oh, right. So if I do have some adults left, what I will do is, oh, hold the line caller. First things first, I will get in some new egg laying dishes because I'm assuming that some of the adults are still alive. Maybe one or two females, one male, and I'll give them a new egg laying tub. So can cocoa fiber. We'll go over the heated area. Here we go. Yep, I can see life. What are they getting today, guys? So today mm -hmm. we're getting some kiwi fruit offcuts, lots of moisture, and they're also getting cat biscuits, the good kind, good quality. This is their protein as well as everything else they need. Carbs. Very voracious. Very voracious eaters. I'll avoid giving putting back any of the moldy or desirable egg cartons. They can have this little thing. Toilet roll, basically. So just a little ladder, essentially, into their little egg laying platform. All right, so here we go. One. When there's females, that's a good thing. Females and at least one male. All right, these guys are doing well these last six or so. So you might. I started with, I did a video actually, and I've linked it, on I only bought 25 adults to start. And the reason why I did that is because crickets are expensive in this country, like really expensive. It was like 40 bucks for um, 25 adults. Oh, and then their water dish. And the reason why I got, I didn't feed them out to my reptiles because I wanted to see if I could breed them and start a new generation. And I have, which is great, as we've seen earlier, and we'll get to that soon. But I've got enough here to start even do more eggs, but we'll see if they've actually laid in their others. That bit of orange is still okay. I'll give them that as well. That's the next one. Now I'll show you, we'll have a look if there's any eggs in this one. I guarantee you there will be. But they've got an inch of mix. The rest is good to go. Where's the lid for this? Very important. The lid. All right, that's ready to go. Now, the baby. To do with the babies. To be very careful with these guys. So we'll check these. We'll gently open these up to see if there's any babies that have hatched. Not yet. Then we'll go into this one. Not yet. But I might amalgamate them. So I might put them all into one big one. All right, so see, we've still got a little egg there. They're not yet. Still still growing, essentially. What to do with this? So I need to clean them out as gently and as best I can because I don't want to lose any of these guys. But what I will do is, what I can do, that's okay. Oh, man, there's so many. Stoked. I do need to give these their bins a, a bit of a more, more of a mist. Make sure that the eggs are all good that still have to come through. Oh, man, there's so many of them. Hundreds in here, man. Holy, in a good way, obviously. I almost like can't put that back in there. And what I'm looking for is evidence of, see that tiny little egg and that little wet patch? I can't see it that well, but that's what I'm looking for. So there's evidence of egg laying in this, which is good. So I'll take that away. That was, it's been in there for like four or five days, so they've easily had plenty of time to lay eggs. So that'll go into the next incubation chamber, essentially. So I've got to transfer these ever so gently into the other bin. So that's what cricket eggs look like, little grice granules. So quite easy to spot, actually, from an insect egg laying perspective. Right, let's transfer them. The whole point of this is that I can move things around and basically have more with less. So I'm basically pouring all the other incubator because I was, I was running out of containers, guys. I was, I was, right? So I was running out of containers. And basically now I have to put this in here as well, right? And this is going to be the main egg laying center, I'll call it. This bin, be really gentle because the eggs get stuck on the side of the containers. Good thing about this cocoa fiber is it doesn't matter how deep it is, that guys, the crickets get out. Oh, yep, there's one. Look at that. Look at that. Here's that little guy. Can you see him? Hang on. Let me focus. Let me focus the camera. There he is. Sit on there, their little, little egg, little alien egg. Anyway, I'll gently kind of get them in there. Yep, good. Now, are there any more? Fucking hell, this is stressful. There we go. There's another one. You know, I've had, this is the first time I've ever bred crickets. And it's been such a learning curve and process for me. You know, you watch all these YouTubers do it and they make it look easy. And I'm like, yeah, that's fair enough. But to me, it was like such a incredibly new learning process for me. It's something that I've learned to do myself. And it's so much more real when you do things yourself. If you know what I mean? Regardless of how easy others make it look, when you actually do it yourself, you get so much more fulfillment out of it. And you know what? In such a journey with these crickets, I almost feel bad like feeding them out. The whole purpose of these guys was to breed them for food for my native geckos, for my tree frogs, for the skinks. But now I'm like, nah, I just, I can't. They're like a pet now. I might change my mind when I start looking at my bank account and being like, oh, I can't afford, can't afford to buy any more live insects this week. So into the cricket bins we go. But for now, so you can't see, but what I'm doing is I'm gently getting you anything off the walls of these enclosures. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. So basically what I'm doing is I am so gently just picking them up. And I've got a whole bundle here. I can't really see them too well, but they're in there. And I'm doing it the rest gently tapping it in. Are there any more that I've missed? Yeah. So anyway, onwards and upwards. All right, so that's done. That container's done. So basically amalgamated them all into here. They're all in here now. Um, and they'll just hatch in one big bin. And like I said, I'm doing that so I can clean up and clear out space and just have them all on one heat pad. 
rather than multiple containers on multiple heat pads. That container's done, and then what I'll do with this one, and then this one here, I will just open up the lid, and the whole point is just put it next to it, and then I'll have these two bins basically. These are new two egg laying, egg hatching bins essentially. And how that will look again, how that will look again is I'll just put it on these heat pads here. Very important, critical misc. Oh, let's get that going first. I'll tell you what, I like this sprayer. Just got it from the old Home Depot equivalent. There we go, give that a good spray. Need to keep the eggs damp. Don't worry about that, that will soak through. Excellent. And if we just go next door, eee, look at them all. So cute. So these guys are on the heat pad. They've run out of water already. Thirsty little critters. Honestly, so many of them. So stoked, eh? They keep hatching day by day. They're growing fast. I've given them kiwi fruit and some dog biscuits, and they look like they're enjoying it, which is good. That's it. Little pinheads. I'm going to watch these guys grow, and hopefully more are going to come out. We'll see. It was supposed to rain overnight, but it didn't. Not much anyway, so I'm still giving these guys their mist. So some flies in here, which is good. So they got food. Give these guys their first mist of the day. There's some new flowerings. These guys as well. Getting their mist. So interesting, eh? So flies in here. So look at this. This native looks like it's dying, but and I thought it was. And I was a bit worried. But then if you look in here, look at that. Flower. Oh, it's not flowering, but everything's growing. Look at that. That's very recent. The last month. I'm pretty stoked. Pretty stoked with that. That's going to like look really lush in probably another like few weeks. Fresh browse, fresh water, fresh water. That's it. Do this two, three times a day, especially on the hot days. I've got an issue. I bought 250 of these soldier fly larvae and nothing wants to eat them. Everything's gone off them. My leopard geckos don't like them. Cunningham skinks doesn't like them. Too big for the tree frogs. And I've got, I don't want them to get away. So you know what? I'm going to try them for the native geckos. So I'm going to try and make a dish for the outside enclosures, put them in today, and see if they go for them. So they'll be good if they do, because these guys are packed full of great protein, great nutrients, everything that's good for them, but for some reason, nothing wants to eat them. They used to like to eat them, not anymore, not sure why. So I've decided to put it here with the forest geckos and Godzilla. Um, so basically, I'm going to put the soldier fly in here, so we've got lots of access to it, and we're going to come back later at night to chop that bit off. But basically, what I'm hoping is, that they'll be able to come in, pick them out of here. Any of access, so we'll see how it goes. So we're going to put it up here for the Ruakawas and the other greens. I think it's going to be a good option for them as well. I want to do the same for them. I've got to get through these black soldier fly larvae. Oh, no, nope, done that wrong. First things first. Give myself the range around the branch, if you know what I mean. This is why you need to give yourself as much groom as you can in these scenarios. Round, round, baby, round, round. The beauty of it is, you just keep tightening it until it gets to the... There we go, perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. There we go, look at that. We're going to go on there. The geckos have access from up here, down there, up here, up here, up here, up here, everywhere. Back to Union Square. All right. So my um, isopod colony is going really well, actually, and I've got to introduce some more adults to them. So basically, oh man, they've wiped out all their vegetation, so I have to feed them tonight. But these guys are in a little plastic Tupperware box. I had to give them about an inch of soil, lots of things to hide under. But let's add the new inhabitants. So I usually try and collect from the wild or the garden once every week. Do a little collection, as many as I can today. I only got five. But it's okay, I add them and get the population growing as much as I can. Well, look at that. If you ever want to see evidence of a gecko eating fruit paste, look at all those Basically, that's all the tongues. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe seven. It's about right. It's like eight geckos in that enclosure. So yeah, that's what it looks like. Next time I'll get them on camera. Stay tuned.